vicars of this church are squeaky clean and obeyed all the rules. Hello and welcome back to my channel and to another history walk around Colchester. In this video I'm going to take a walk up East Hill, following in the footsteps of the Parliamentarian General, Thomas Fairfax, on his way into town to take the surrender of Colchester on the 27th of August, 1648. I'm starting my journey here at the old siege house, probably one of Colchester's more recognisable buildings. The building's involvement in the siege is twofold. First of all, it was the forward headquarters for the Parliamentarian Army. It was from here that General Fairfax and his entourage made his, left here and made their way up into town to take the, take the surrender of Colchester. But it's also a building that was attacked during the siege as well. There are some very interesting um, red circles on the outside of the building. Those are musket ball impact marks and the, Parliament, the Royalists, I should say, made a volley out of the east gate of Colchester down East Hill to attack this position around the 14th of July 1648. They got off a couple of volleys of, uh, of musket fire and then made a hasty retreat back up into the town. And today when anyone says or recommends anything to do with the siege, it's always, oh yes, of the siege house. But there's far more to the history of Colchester and the siege of 1648 than the building behind me, although this building did play its part. history walks around Colchester and I've really been amazed by the amount of history that this town has to offer. It's been very difficult filming with all the noise of the traffic and people and general ambient noise. It's not until you start to do something like vlogging uh, that you appreciate just uh, how noisy the everyday house, the everyday high street is. But if you've enjoyed my other videos, then hit that subscribe button and support my channel. Just click the button in the bottom right hand corner of your screen or on the home page to my YouTube channel. I've often wondered what uh, Colchester might be like if the siege hadn't have happened. The siege ca uh, caused a lot of uh, destruction in Colchester. So if we start by looking at that destruction and assuming that it never happened, what would Colchester be like today? Or probably be like today. However, we know that uh, at the end of the siege, the town's walls were largely intact and they were pulled down on the orders of Sir Thomas Fairfax. However, only certain sections of the town wall were pulled down and that mainly affected the south side. So walking down Sir Isaac's Walk today, all those lovely buildings on the uh, shops on, the, on one side probably would be sections of Roman wall today. And then there's the, uh, the head gate. Well many entrance gates into other towns and cities across Europe have all survived to the modern day. There are some good examples in Lincoln and York. So why shouldn't the head gate have survived? After all, St John's Gate House has survived and that was attacked during the siege as well. Um, and the Bolton Gate. That could easily be a, a more substantial ruin than it is today. But the biggest area, probably in the parish of St Botolfs, uh, down by the Priory, because that area was hit numerous times with, uh, with cannon fire. Fifty-two houses were destroyed in the parish of St Botolfs alone, and that's more than any other parish in Colchester. Um, and many of those cannonballs hit the Priory. So the chances are the Priory will be a, a more substantial ruin than it is today. Which means there'll be a lot of more old buildings uh, around the Priory. Perhaps some resembling those in the Dutch quarter of Colchester. 
or in um, Silent Street in Ipswich but there's some wonderful Tudor buildings that have survived to the present day so the overall feel of Colchester would be much more than it is today a different ambience and a different layout of the town especially in certain areas just walked past uh, an Indian restaurant on the uh, on the other side of the road it's called the Sonali but the, the building used to be a pub called the Whalebone. Um, first recorded around 1760, 1770. Uh, it closed in 1935. And uh, every time I walk past that restaurant, I can taste curry for some reason. Uh, I've had many a good meal in there. buildings on East Street, the oldest of which dates from 1692, but a majority of the older ones still standing uh, date from around the 1750s to the 1780s. But opposite the Sonali, or the old Whalebone pub, is uh, another interesting building. It used to be the home of the Colchester Brewery Company. They were founded by, in uh, 1828 by Christopher Stopes and Robert Hernard. The building is no longer a brewery, and it's now residential flats. But the red door behind me is where the dray carts used to come in and out, delivering full beer to the pubs and returning the empties for refilling. There's even an eagle statue on the top with a date of 1828 written underneath. Just a little further up on the left-hand side is another old building. It used to be a, an auction house, but I believe when it was built in the 1920s or 30s, it was actually a, a car showroom. Uh, there used to be a car manufacturing plant in Colchester, I think in the 1930s, uh, called the Britannia Works. So it may have been something to do with that, perhaps a, a showroom. But there's plenty of space inside to, uh, to get vehicles in, and the drop curb at the front as well. Um, it's a little outside my realms of knowledge, but uh, if you happen to know, I would be interested in finding out. So please, just drop me a comment in the comment section. And, uh, and let me know, I would be very interested. A little bit further up on the left-hand side, um, the court on the junction with, uh, with Priory Street is another old pub. Uh, it was called the Ship Inn, and it was established as in um, 1764, and closed in 1980. I you think it's now, uh, it looks like offices now, um, but it was quite a good place to be, just opposite a brewery, so quite handy for getting beer. There were quite a few old pubs on, uh, on East Hill as well. I haven't, uh, obviously haven't mentioned all of them. Just a little further up is where the East Gate used to stand. This was the Eastern Postern into the town of Colchester. And there's even a plaque on the wall to, uh, to commemorate that it was here. It actually fell down in 1651 and the remains were finally removed back in 1675. But there's also a section of, uh, of Roman wall as well. It's uh, currently in a private housing area, so I can't go in. But I did go in here um, a few years ago, I sneaked in. So here are some pictures of the, uh, of the Roman wall. The most impressive building up here on East Hill is the Church of St. James. It's actually the largest of all the churches in Colchester. I did have a little look through to try and find some scandal, to try and find some vicars who were doing naughty things. But the vicars of this church are squeaky clean and obeyed all the rules. However, there was a vicar between 1510 and 1536, and his name was John Wayne. church has another interesting connection and that's to a man called John Ball. Now John Ball was a, was a curate here but he was also the leader of the, uh, the Peasants' Revolt. But whether it's the same person or not um, I'm a little, little sceptical. There was a John Ball registered in the court rolls of Colchester on the 30th of January 1352. Could it be the same person as the John Ball from the Peasants' Revolt? 
Anyway, there's a plaque in, uh, in the church to, uh, to commemorate him. There are two pieces of, uh, of local history just behind me. The first is a fountain, which dates from the 1860s, with a description on, this, on the outside, with joy shall we draw water. And in the, one of the bricks, there's, a, there's the letters have been carved, JP-AP, which marks the boundary between All Saints Parish and St James's Parish. The building behind me is called Greyfriars. The site was once a religious order of Greyfriars, founded in the 13th century. The building today dates from uh, 1755 and is built in a neoclassical style. In 1849, it became a private house to Stephen Brown, a local magistrate who also owned a silk factory. In 1903, the building became a school and served cultures over a hundred years. It's now a hotel and restaurant. Winsley's house and it dates from the 1670s and it's named after Arthur Winsley, its most famous resident. There's a memorial to, to, uh, to Winsley in St James's Church but in his will he made money and houses available for the poor. His legacy has still benefited the people of Colchester today. The building next to Winsley's house is called East Lodge and it was built in 1600 for a Dr John Duke. However Dr Duke was not the only doctor to have resided in that property. From 1895 to 1945, it was, home to the, it was then home to uh, Dr. Benjamin Nicholson. And in 1901, he performed the first appendectomy here in Colchester. Just crossed over the road to get a view of uh, another of Colchester's interesting houses. It's called the Minories. And it was first acquired in 1731 by a man called Isaac Boggis. Boggis made his money through the Bayes trade but um, it wasn't called the Minories until about 1870, when it became fashionable to give, give buildings names rather than numbers. But the house has another medical connection as well, because it used to be the home of Dr. Ruth and Susan Butt, and she was the first uh, female GP in Colchester. She bought the house in 1915 and resided there until 1935 when she died. In 1936, the, uh, the house became part of the Minories Trust, and today it's an art gallery. Just behind me is the, uh, the Wetzler Garden. But in 1648, this was Freya's house, and this house played its part in the surrender of Colchester. In 1648, this area was called Freya's House, and behind the house was a yard. And that yard played its part in the surrender of Colchester on the 27th of August, 1648. Before General Fairfax arrived in the town shortly after two o'clock on that afternoon, he gave orders that all unlisted men and private soldiers should gather in Freya's yard. All colours and drums and weapons should be taken to St James's on East Hill and all horses and cavalrymen to go to uh, St Mary's at the Walls. These gardens are called the Wetzlar Gardens because Colchester has been twinned with Wetzlar since 1969. The idea of twinning towns was conceived back in 1947. The idea was to uh, build bridges and heal relationships between different countries. Needless to say, there are many towns in England who are twinned with towns in Germany. next to the Wetzler Garden is Holly Tree's house. The house was, uh, was built in 1718 for a lady called Elizabeth Cornelson, but she died in 1719 before the house was completed. The house then passed to the Crefield family 
and to a lady called Sarah Creffield. Now she married a man called uh, Charles Gray and he was the MP for Colchester various times from 1742 to 1780. And this was their marital home. Sir Charles Gray also inherited Colchester Castle. It was given to him as a wedding present. The idea was to make a nice little folly in his garden. He also bought land around the, gar the, the castle as well. And we know that land today as Castle Park. It was Sir Charles Grey who put the, the roof onto the castle as well. He had a man called James Dean do some internal repairs on the, on the house. And it's probably him who, who did the repairs to the castle. That, it, that uh, Italian style roof instead of fortifications and ramparts. The house today is now, uh, now a museum. An absolutely brilliant museum and well worth visiting. But one of the, um, one of the exhibitions in there is a collection of old clocks made by Colchester's clockmakers. This was the private collection of a, a man called Bernard Mason. And he used to live at uh, Timperley's house. And before that was re uh, remodeled into a restaurant, that used to be a clock museum. But all the clocks were moved out and are now housed here at Holly Tree's house. finishing my vlog here at Colchester's War Memorial. The memorial was created in 1923 to designs by Henry Charles Farr and the work was completed by a local company called LJ Watts & Co. LJ Watts also made the uh, Winsley statue which is housed in St James's Church. Anyway I hope you've enjoyed this little video and this little walk up East Hill in Colchester. If you have give it a thumbs up, give it a like and be sure to leave a comment below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.